Mm. Who's the easiest to put up with? He's easy. He's easy? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Happy anniversary. Okay, we do have just a few announcements. Um, first of all, on Wednesday, we got started with our ladies uh, of faith and service, our new Bible book that we're studying this, this time, and it's Habakkuk. So we found out a lot of things in there that we enjoyed. So if you can come on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, we'll be meeting uh, to study the book of Habakkuk. The other thing on here was um, feed the kids as some of our... Uh, Items got moved into the clear bags. Those are going to represent when a bag is complete, uh, we have reached our goal for the next Feed the Kid packing. So if you want to keep that in mind and the items as, as to what they cost to fill approximately 200 bags um, is in your bulletin today. The other thing that we had done uh, a week ago, the ladies had filled the bags for the homeless so we still have a few bags in the t a container here under the offering and tithe box. Uh, if you'll put these in your car and then uh, when you come up on a homeless person, you will have those available, someone in need, that you can bless them with the bags. So there's a number of different items that we put in those bags. And then this is new on here, cookies. It says they need cookies, lots of cookies, lots of cookies, huh? This is for a youth endeavor for the end of the month, so they need the cookies brought to the church on the 31st. Is the 31st a Sunday? A Wednesday. Okay. So uh, you can bring them Wednesday morning. We will be here if you need to bring your cookies in. Or if maybe you've frozen your cookies, you could go ahead and bring those the week before. So Jean can have those to uh, furnish for it. Um, let me see, what is it actually called? Leadership Conference, okay. Ignite. Ignite, yes. And it will be February the 3rd. So if you'll keep that in mind. Then we have a Bible story today with Nikki and the kids. So I'll say a prayer, and if the kids would like to come, and Nikki for a Bible story. Our Heavenly Father, we come into your presence, Father, and we thank you for all your bounty for the blessings that you bestow upon us, the way that you meet our needs. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we just come to you praising you for who you are, Father, that you love us the way that you do, that you lead, guide, and direct us in our lives. And, Father, I pray that you'd be with the story as Nikki tells the story, that the children will receive it, Heavenly Father, that it make a difference in all of our life. And, Father, we thank you for Ted and for the praise team and the way that they lead us into worshiping you. Father, I just pray that you'd be with the furtherance of that and be with Casey as he brings the word that it might change a heart, Heavenly Father, that we would receive you in a greater way and do greater work for you with you living, working through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Hi. How are all of you? You guys good? Are you good this morning? Yeah. You're good? Okay. Just checking. So today... We are going to talk about faith. Ooh, what is faith? What is faith? What is it? It is not. It is not. What else is it? That's what it's not. What is it? Hmm, that's a big, hard church word that's kind of hard to explain sometimes. But let's think about it this way. Have any of you ever planted a seed or a plant? Have any of you ever done that? Yeah. yeah. You have? But I didn't know. Oh, wow. So when you plant a seed, that is faith. Because you have faith that what's going to happen? It'll, there's a flower that it'll grow. That's right. You don't see it, but you just have faith that it's going to grow. Well, there's a story in the Bible that talks about faith, and it talks about Jesus' friends, and they were asking him how they could have stronger faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you could say to a tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey it. 
So what that means is you could tell that tree, get up and move if you had faith. Well, Jesus said, hi, guys. How are you? We're so glad to see you. We are so glad you're here. Jesus said that God is so powerful that if our faith is even as small as that little seed you planted in the ground, was that seed you planted in the ground big? Yeah. How, it's like that, that big? About that big? How big was your seed? Was it about that big? Uh -huh, that's pretty small, huh? If you have that much faith, then you can do mighty things because, do you know why? Do you know why with you that much faith you can do mighty things? Made you made a flower? How did you make a flower? Um, at my school. At your school you made a flower? And there were seeds. And there were seeds. Do you know how you did that? Was it with your power rider? Did you make that seed grow? Or did God have something to do with it? <laughs> well, why we can do amazing things with faith the size of a mustard seed is that we don't use our faith. We use God's. So if you knew you had that kind of power, what would you be doing with it? If we knew our faith could do move a great big tree, I know I certainly would be telling more people about Jesus and my prayers would be a lot bigger than they are. So it doesn't take great faith for great things to happen because what happens doesn't depend on us, but on God. God has the power to do anything and God is for us so we can trust whatever he does. So this week, I want you to think about a little seed and all the things that God can do, just like he grows a great big tree from that. Let's pray. God, we ask for a mustard seed size faith. Help us believe and never doubt your mighty power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise to your feet. We will continue our praise and worship. Because of our faith, we know our God is greater. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind.
heaven, you are so great, so mighty. Our creator of heaven and earth and all that we know. We are so grateful that you love us enough to want to be with us. Desire to be in our presence. And I pray, Father, that our hearts and minds will be tender enough to allow you to be in our lives, to guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Good morning. morning. How's everybody doing? I'm going to have you do an unusual thing this morning. Don't open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. If you have a paper book binded Bible, would you open that up to your table of contents? If you don't have one, probably looks an awful lot like this one that I got up for you. Tablets and phones probably don't do a table of contents the same way a, a book may. Everybody find a table of contents? It's probably not a, a thing you're familiar with using in your Bible. It could be one of those fancy Bibles that has the little tabs on the side. You just put your thumb on the tab, go straight to where you're looking. All right, so if you got your table of contents ready, what's it list there? What's on that listing? Books of the Bible. 66 of them, I would think. Those 66 books of the Bible are split up into two divisions. What are those divisions? Old and New, say that again. Old and New Testament. Did you ever wonder why your Bible is split into what is called testaments? Did you ever think, what's a testament? Well, the, the Greek word that that the testament is derived from is diatheke. Diatheke, testament. In this case, testament. What is, what is a testament? Well, if you are giving a witness statement in a court of law, if you're sitting in that, uh, that booth and the lawyers are, are asking questions and the judge is sitting on the side... You are giving a testimony. You are giving a word that is promised to be true. Okay? That testament and testimony are related. When somebody passes away, there's a document that determines who gets what possessions. Have you heard of a last will and and testament? So what does a a testament have to do with distributing your possessions? Well, it is a a legal document. It's literally an agreement that certain things will go to certain people. The testament has a, a bit of a promise and a bit of legality tied to it. Your Bible, at the beginning of those uh, sections calls those two sections testaments. But here's the strange thing. Diatheke is actually translated in other places of your Bible differently. Turns out that there's another word that also means promise, a formal kind of agreement. Covenant. Diatheke throughout your Bible is most often translated and kind of more correctly translated as covenant. 
turns out that your two sections of your Bible, the Old and New Testament, that everyone has been very familiar with, might be better translated as covenants. Old covenant, new covenant. Okay? So then, what is a covenant? What does that word even mean? Well, a covenant is really, like we just talked about with Testament, it is a promise. It's kind of a, a legal kind of agreement, a, a formalized promise by two parties that certain things will be done. We talked about this idea of covenant a few months back in my Wednesday night Bible study. In the Wednesday night Bible study, we are about to finish uh, a series of lessons on Abraham. Starting in Genesis chapter 11, going throughout a bulk of Genesis, we see Abraham's life from being called to come to this new land by God when he wasn't even Abraham. He was just Abram. Chapter 12, verse 1, is where we get this call. If you got your Bible ready now, flip over to that chapter 12 in Genesis. Let's look and see where this idea of covenant shows up this idea of an agreement between parties to do certain things, to act in certain ways. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Does God promise and tell Abram that he will do something for him? It's a whole lot of blessing to be had right there. Blessing, just count how many times the word blessing shows up. God will be blessing Abram. He will make his descendants into a great nation, a great name. And if God were to do all that for Abram's sake, what is it that Abram therefore will be doing for God? What is God calling him to do? Go from your country your father's, your country and your father's household to the land I will show you. When Abram walks away from his father's household and goes to this new land, which by the way, nowhere here does it claim God tell Abram where he will end up yet. He's just agreeing to head out wherever God pleases to send him without knowing where. That God will bless him Bless those that know him. Bless those who bless him. Curse those who curse him. And make his people a great nation. This is a covenant relationship. It is a promise. It is an agreement between God and Abram. That each party, God and Abram, will do certain things in regard to the other party. God will do the blessing. Abram will do the going. That's it. Well, it turns out that the idea of covenant relationship shows up all throughout the Old Testament, which probably should be called the Old Covenant. But there's many covenants there. Let me show you a few. Let's go back in Genesis, since you're there in Genesis chapter 12. Just flip backward a few chapters to chapter 9. Noah was in a covenant kind of relationship. Kind of like Abram. God would promise to do certain things if Noah had to take care of doing some certain things of his own. Chapter 9, verse 8. Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant, there's the word even, 
my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Noah had built the ark. Noah had taken animals of every kind onto the ark. Floods came. Noah survives. The animals survive. And when they get out of the ark, God makes an agreement with Noah. It's a covenant. I will not bring flood like that again. In Exodus, if you want to take a look with me, Exodus chapter 19. This is now after Noah, well after Abram. This is Moses in Exodus. Israel, the descendants of Abraham, had gone off into Egypt and become slaves. For 400 years they lived in slavery. God sends Moses to bring them up, to to bring them out of Egypt, to go to a promised land. The plagues strike the Egyptians. People leave at the Passover. Pharaoh decides to follow the people of Egypt out, traps them there at the shore of the Red Sea. God miraculously spreads the, the Red Sea, parting the water. Israel walks through safely. Pharaoh and his army, not so much. That didn't work out too well for them. In chapter 19, there's a covenant relationship that is made between God and the people of Israel. He had said before, back with Abraham, I will make you a great nation. Now we get to see how that comes to be. There's a huge nation. There's more than a million people in Israel's population. And God is calling them out, rescuing them. But he wants to build a relationship with them and set up kind of a a formal agreement. Chapter 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. God himself is telling Moses, tell them this is an A covenant. This is a solemn promise. It is an agreement that Israel will be my people. Moses delivers that message, tells the people that God is keeping that relationship that started with Abraham, went through Isaac, went through Jacob for 400 years with those descendants. So in chapter 19, verse 7, How do the people respond? Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. Were there two parties to this covenant, to this agreement? God on one side, Israel on the other. God set forth some terms, had a a proposal on the table, so to speak. Maybe I shouldn't say on the table. Maybe I should say on the tablet. Maybe that's a little bit more appropriate. The people hear that this is the covenant idea, and they agree. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. So you know what's given. The actual commandments. The Mosaic Law. They agree from the gate, from the beginning, we are all in this relationship with God. If you've read your Bible, how's that work out for the people of Israel? Yikes. 
things don't go well. Israel settles into the promised land, but it wasn't even these people that left Egypt. It was their descendants because they had to wander around for 40 years because they couldn't trust God in the plan that he had set for them. Then if you keep reading in your Bible, you see about the time of the judges. Israel had not gone out and, and, and conquered the land and really established what he had set up intending for them. And so they were oppressed. They had enemies that were really occupying their land that they should have been granted. Time of judges comes around. And you see this cyclical behavior where they get close to God. And over time, with this judge, that closeness where, or after that judge leaves, the closeness with God departs. They start retreating away from God. That covenant is broken on their behalf. And they fall into some kind of oppression. Enemies come upon them. And what do they do? Just like the people in Egypt in slavery, they cry out to God. God rescues them through a, a judge, a, a new judge, frees those people, and everything is back to being hunky-dory, great relationship, until it falls apart again. Very, very cyclical. Turns out that the judges weren't enough for Israel. They actually call for a king. They want God to set up a kingdom. We want to be like our neighbors, all those other people, the ones that are oppressing us. They have kings, why can't we? So you get into the book of Samuel and you see how Saul was set to be king. That didn't work out so well. David replaces him. Guess what there is with David and God? There's a covenant. It's called the Davidic covenant. It makes it easy to remember that it's David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, if you want to follow along. David has at this point established his own kingdom after Saul. He's actually become king not just of his home, Judah, but also Israel, the entire country, uniting uh, the parts of Israel under his leadership. Things are going very, very well. And God has a message for David that he sends through a prophet to speak to David. And he has an interesting thing. Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. Is God making a promise here to David? Sure enough. God's setting forth a covenant, an agreement of how this relationship is to go forward. God's done all these things to establish David's kingdom, but he's not done. I'm going to make you famous as anyone who's ever lived on earth. And this Davidic covenant has another part. Let me show you. Skip over to verse 11 there in chapter 7. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. Wow. I will be his father and he will be my son. If you read the beginning there in verse 11, 12, and the first half of 13, it sounds like God's telling him about Solomon. What is it that Solomon is known for building? A temple. Is he a son of David's? Sure. David was told, I'm going to set up this line of kings. I'm going to raise someone up from your family who will come and build the temple. But he didn't even stop there. If, this covenant relationship of, is kind of like, anybody grow up watching game shows? I, I watched game shows growing up. 
you would have like, let's make a deal, or, or you would have prices right. You know, Bob Barker up there standing up, asking people for bidding on prices of things. And they loved to open the curtain and show the special prize. You know, here, here's our, our prize for you. And they get all the crowd worked up. They get the contestant worked up. And then they add to it. And if that's not good enough, look at this other prize right here, folks. Anybody watch game shows where they do that? They just kind of want to build up the excitement in the crowd. You know, you can win two toasters or you can win this nice new car. And if the car is not nice enough, we can send you to Hawaii on top of it. You know, that's kind of how they worked. Well, God's doing that with David here. I've already set you up a nice kingdom, but that's not all. I'm going to make your family a line of kings. But then he tops it off with a kicker. I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Well, who is it that ends up referring to? It sounded like Solomon building the temple, but it's not. It's Jesus. Jesus is the descendant of David who rules forever. God is letting David know that the Messiah, Jesus, will come through his own family. He will rule forever. What starts off as sounding like a, a prophecy for, for just that next generation ends up being one that's forever. Jesus himself will come from David's line. Sounds like a, a pretty good covenant. Did David have to do much in this covenant? David here... With Nathan, David doesn't have to do anything. This is God bestowing all these things on David. It's like winning the lottery. Sometimes the covenants were like that. Sometimes covenants in the Old Testament were agreements where each party had to fulfill their promises. Sometimes it was one-sided. God would just say, here's what I'm going to do for you. This is a pretty special one. So how does that work out now with David's line? If you've read the Old Testament, how does David's family deal with being kings? That doesn't work out so well. The kings lose that relationship with God. Solomon might have been a wise guy, but after him, it didn't go so well. The kingdom even splits. David's descendants don't have a good outcome until Jesus. That's the king that will rule forever. When things weren't going well, that idea of covenant shows up again. We've seen covenant with Abram. We've seen it with Noah. We've seen it here with David. There are many other covenants in your Bible, but I want to show you one other one. 400 years after David, another 400 year span, Israel has fallen, or sorry, Judah has fallen so far away from God, the kingdom of Babylon is at the gates of Jerusalem. They've conquered the rest of Judah. They're trying to take the capital city of Jerusalem. Israel has already been defeated, the, the northern part of the country years before a prophet named Jeremiah is sent to kind of prepare David's descendant the king at that time to get him to understand that this is all part of God's plan but he's got a unique message that really isn't understood I want to show you one other covenant from the Old Testament turn over to Jeremiah chapter 31 some people call this the new covenant. And I'll show you why. Jeremiah was the prophet who lived the downfall of Judah. He was present for the worst of it. And he survived. And we have his prophecy before. We have his story during. 
But in chapter 31, he says something interesting. God tells him, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. Your Old Testament is that story. How God selected a people, Abram's descendants, promised Abram to make this great nation, nations actually, the one that he selected in Egypt, rescuing them, promising that he will be their God if they will follow and obey him. And man, that doesn't work. They break the covenant time after time after time. And finally, when it's all falling apart, when, when the promised land is about to be taken away, when they are about to be kicked out, Jeremiah's given this message saying, I'm going to make a new covenant. You messed up the last one. You couldn't keep it. So we got to start over. This new covenant is totally different. It's not follow my rules and regulations, follow the Mosaic law. That didn't work for Israel. They lost track of who God was and, and really what God wanted. He wanted them to obey. If you remember that early covenant, if you will obey. They were more wrapped up in, in the letter of the law than of who God was. And they lost track of it. Jeremiah says there's going to be a time where God will establish a new covenant, a new agreement, a new way to build this relationship with God's people. Know where that shows up in your Bible, this new covenant? That word new, for example, is a big clue. What's the other word that's tied very closely to covenant? Testament. So guess what the New Testament is? It's a record of this new agreement between God and his people to have this relationship. Jeremiah in verse 33 says, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will know or they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more more. Does that sound very New Testament-like, very gospel-like? Yes, it does. God has established a new way to be in relationship with him. That's what the gospel is. That's what the whole New Testament is. And I can prove it to you. It's not just me up here saying what sounds good in Sunday school-like. I can prove it to you. Take a look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew 26, Jim Gardner is going to open his King James Bible. How many of you actually have King James with you this morning? Ooh, Danny got his. If you got your King James, you're really going to follow along with me here. If you got one of those modern newfangled Bibles, you might see something a little bit different. This is the Last Supper, chapter 26. It's that last Passover. Jesus is sitting with his disciples having a meal. We call today that Last Supper. And there's a couple of things that Jesus points out to his disciples at that time that now, in, in hindsight, it's very clear what he was trying to get them to understand. But at that time, they, they missed it. They didn't understand it. 
In verse 27, Jesus says, and he took the, or sorry, Jesus doesn't say yet. Verse 27 says, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, now this is what Jesus said, drink ye all of it. I got a feeling Jesus didn't say the word ye, but that's what King James has. Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. That's what the King James says, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now, if you got one of those newer Bibles, it doesn't say New Testament. NIV I put up. NIV says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of of sin. The testament, the covenant is Jesus and his blood. That last supper was to point out that Jesus is that one and only, that final ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. When you open up your Bibles, When you see Old Testament, when you see New Testament, I want you to understand that testament means a covenant. It means an agreement to act in a certain way in a relationship between parties. The Old Testament is full of of other covenants between not just God and, and various peoples, but between different men. And in each of these covenant ideas, it's an agreement that one party will do such and such, another party will do such and such. That's how this relationship works. Well, when one party doesn't keep up their end of the deal, you throw out the whole relationship or you try to build the relationship back in a new manner. Which is it that God has chosen to do with people? Build a new relationship in a new manner. That's what Jesus is. That's why half of your Bible is the New Testament. It's the new covenant. It's the new agreement. New rules for this relationship. Jesus is the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. And he even pointed that out at the Last Supper to those disciples. Now, let me ask you a question. Got to ask that question. Got to get that in. How many of you have yourselves entered into this covenant relationship with God? How many of you have read through the New Testament understand the gospel message of Jesus of Jesus on the cross, Jesus' blood and the forgiveness of sin that he was pointing out, and have agreed to be in a relationship with God in that format. Because it's not by us sacrificing. That was the whole Mosaic covenant you got to keep these commandments, and when you don't, you're going to end up having to sacrifice some of your animals. We don't do that anymore. So how does this relationship work? If you're in agreement, how does that work? Well, if you read through the entire New Testament, from Matthew all the way to the, the other Gospels, to the history in Acts, to the Epistles, to Revelation... That relationship, our part of it, our obligation, is faith. So when I ask how many of you have agreed to be in a relationship and entered into that covenant, really what that means is you've given your faith. Do you believe, Nikki was up here trying to to talk to the kids about faith today. Faith just means What is it that you believe that you have built your life upon? What do you feel so strongly about that you enter fully and wholeheartedly into agreement? 
And I say those words specifically because that's a, a covenant kind of language. You don't half-heartedly agree to a contractual agreement, to a, a covenant idea. You're either all in or you're all out. There is no, as Jesus would say, <clears throat> lukewarm. There is no halfway. Look what happened with the people of Israel. They weren't full in with God. Didn't work out so well for Israel. It's what Jeremiah witnessed. So today, I'm going to ask that question again. How many of you have entered into that contractual agreement? You've given your life. You've put your faith in Jesus. If you haven't, that opportunity still exists. As long as you are living and breathing and have a will of your own to make choices in your life, you can make that choice to give your life, put your faith in Jesus. But there is a little caveat to that contract. It has a deadline. And I'll use the word deadline for good reason. Because there will be a time when you die. And you will not have a say. You will not have a will to agree to be in a relationship. It will be too late at that time. So one last time, have you been and are you now in that contractual agreement? Have you given your life to Jesus? Why don't you all stand with me? I'm going to ask Ted to bring up our worship team. I think that's a, a good ending place for today. We are here at a, an invitation time, the end of a sermon. It's a time to kind of reflect and call it an invitation, I think, because it's time to invite the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, to really reveal to us what we need to do in our own mind, our hearts, our lives. How do we respond to what the gospel says, to what the Bible says, and if the question is on the table today, are you in that covenant relationship? Now's the time to, to be truthful with yourself about that and, and make up your mind. If that's something that, that still needs to be, I would invite you today to make that happen. There's no better time than today. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you. We thank you for this day that we get to come together in your name. I pray for each person here. I pray that we could easily, easily look at the truth in our lives and see where we stand with you. Have we made that agreement? Have we put faith and trust in you, what the Bible says about you? Do we believe in the death on the cross for our sin? And if we don't, then I pray that each person here would would reassess that and make a new decision. But I pray, Father, for your will. I pray in your name. Amen. Have thy no Before we close, I got to update uh, something that uh, I had talked about uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, Ann Louderback, most of you already know that uh, she is with her daughter on hospice care. Uh, they found that she's got, she had, what initially got her in the hospital was her heart was not functioning, she was low on oxygen, so they found that she had fluid that was building up and 
uh, was really debilitating. But while she was in the hospital, they also found that she's got a mass on her kidney. And so that really meant that they couldn't treat anything with the fluid. And they sent her home on hospice. Uh, she's with her daughter, uh, living just uh, uh, across from the Vegeta Bridge, south of Belen, there with her daughter in her family's home. And a lot of people have been asking me about how to get a hold of Anne, how to, how to talk with her, how to visit with her. Um, I, I want to change something that I had said before. Probably the best way right now if you want to visit with Anne, which she is very, very talkative. She's in bed. I got a room that's basically been set up as a hospice, kind of hospital-style room. Uh, but she is very, very talkative, taking visitors. Uh, very, very... Cons <laughs> if you know Anne, she, she'll talk to you. She'll talk to your ear off. Uh, she's got her trusted TV sitting there watching Fox News. That, that's still a thing. Uh, and she'll tell you all about it. But if you are interested in visiting with Anne, uh, please let me know. And with her daughter, I will set up a visitation time if you want to get down there to see her. Uh, I've already taken a few people to go down, and that probably seems to be working out the best to, to have me uh, go down and show people, which, by the way, it's it's... Uh, a farm down south, uh, so it's probably best for me to go and, and show people how to get there, first of all. But if you are interested in visiting with Anne, want to talk with her, um, please let me know, and we can set up an appointment. Uh, my best days, I was just saying before service today, probably Tuesdays and, and Thursdays are, are best for me, but it sounds like there's not a, a better or a worse day for uh, Anne's daughter for their schedule, uh, just mornings. Mornings are the best time. She's got most energy uh, and, and is really seeing more visitors in the morning. So if you're interested to go, please let me know and uh, I'll get that scheduled up and we'll talk about days. Uh, Ted, you were talking about going. Mm -hmm. yeah. Barry just went down there and Barry took his binder of songs. She likes singing. She likes to hear songs. She had a request in the garden. That was her big one. So Rowene, what song did you get to sing? Same one. So Ted, I'm just saying, if that's your plan, you got to have in the garden, in the repertoire. It's a request. I can tell you ahead of time. Uh, do you got a prayer to go with our closing song? Sure. All right. Thank you. Please bow with me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the worship, the message that you've placed in our hearts today. We pray, Father, that we would be mindful of knowing how great you are and how loving and gracious you are to each and every one of us, Father. Because we don't always do everything right. I know I don't. But you love us enough that you sent your son. So, Father, with even just the smallest bit of faith, knowing that you love us, I pray that it will rest heavy on our hearts that we turn to you for everything each and everything that we give you all that we are all of our hearts and all of our minds and tell you each and every day that we love you in Jesus precious name we pray and give thanks reach out and take the hand of somebody next to you Thank you.